Our text today is from the 20th chapter of the book of Kings. And he cried unto the king and said, Thy servant went out into the thick of the battle. And behold, one turned aside and brought a captive unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means the prisoner be missing, then thy life shall be for his life. Many of you know the story of the famous American woman, Helen Keller. She was born blind and deaf and mute, and yet she learned to read and write and speak. She graduated from Radcliffe College with high honors and traveled widely, inspiring others, especially soldiers who had been blinded in combat. But almost as remarkable, is the story of her teacher, Miss Ann Sullivan. Her story has been dramatized as the miracle worker, and for good reason. Where does one even begin to teach a child that cannot see or hear or speak? Later on, Miss Sullivan said something that is worth remembering. I saw clearly that it was impossible to teach her language or anything else until she learned to obey me. And I have thought about that a great deal since, Miss Sullivan went on to say. And the more I think, the more certain I am that obedience is the gateway through which knowledge Yes, and love too. Enter into the mind of a child. A little child does not understand why two plus two is four and not five. Does not know why there have to be 26 weird looking letters in the English alphabet. And how you string them together to form words and sentences and thoughts. But. As that child obeys, it starts to become clear to him and make sense to him. And one day he is glad that his teacher loved him enough and cared for him enough to make him obey. Now that is the Bible viewpoint also, not only about children, but about all real religion. You cannot trust a God that you will not obey. And trusting God, leaning hard on God, committing your life into God's hands is the name of the game. We cannot see clearly into the future. We do not know what tomorrow's consequences will be for what we do today. We cannot see how the whole war is being fought along the battlefront, for we can only see in our small place on the battle line. But we can trust and obey the captain of our salvation. And it's only as we obey him that we learn something of the wisdom and the love and the blessing that God has in his great heart to give us. Now, the subject of obedience is never popular, especially among Americans. But it happens to be the burden of the text before us today. The scene opens on the highway running south to the city of Samaria. The roadway is thronged with weary but happy soldiers coming home after the war. Everywhere the citizens have turned out to welcome the boys back home. They are waiting in particular for the man of the hour, King Ahab, to come along in the royal chariot. And one man in particular is waiting, battle-stained and dirty, 
bandages on his head. He appears to be a battle-fatigued soldier from the field. But this man is waiting with a word for the king that will cause the sun to go behind a dark cloud and shadows to fall upon this bright and happy day in Israel. And in many ways, this day was the brightest day in the 22 years that King Ahab ruled over Israel. Two times in the past two years, the Assyrians had stampeded over Israel's northern borders. Two times King Ben-Hadad had brought his military machine into the heart of Israel. Two times he had driven the small army of Ahab up against the wall. And on each occasion, the prophet of God came into the camp and put courage into the hearts of the people and king by telling them to turn to their Lord, to trust in him. For the Lord can save by many or by few. On both occasions, the promises of the Lord proved true. And on the second occasion, even more dramatically than the first. For beaten once, Ben-Hadad came back the second time better prepared. No mercenaries this time, but his own troops. No overconfidence this time, but with well-conceived plans. No guerrilla warfare up there in the mountains this time. But on the flat field of battle where the Syrian chariots and cavalry could be deployed. And across the field from the Syrians stood the small army of Ahab, huddled, shivering, and frightened, the text tells us, like a small flock of goats in comparison to the Syrians that filled the land. And at the time, the word of the Lord must have seemed incredible to them. But it came fully to pass. The battle was never in doubt. The destroyers of Israel were destroyed. The field lay strewn with the Syrian dead and dying. And the survivors met the same fate, crowding into the fortress city of Aphek, where the walls collapsed and crushed them to death by the thousands. But nobody could have foreseen what would happen next. King Ben-Hadad came creeping out of a basement cellar where he had been hiding to plead for his life. And King Ahab, King Ahab welcomes him, calls him, my brother, he invites him, here, step up here in the royal chariot with me. You don't have to be a political scientist to realize the bad mistake Ahab here is making calling the arch enemy of Israel his friend. Was it out of some sort of egotistical vanity, the way politicians sometimes are? Did he think this was a master stroke of statesmanship to call an enemy a brother? Or did he think he could secure the northern boundaries of his country? by paying money to an enemy. One thing is sure, Ahab did not view the victory the way God did, who gave it. Ahab, in the, once the hour of danger was passed, quite forgot about the Lord's hand in it all. Ahab figured that he had gained the victory, and he would gain it again if need be, and that he, not God, would guide the destiny of his people Israel. But it's an easy mistake to make. You look back to any success in your own life, 
any escape from some tight spot or the long days that you have lived on this earth and there's only two ways of looking at it. Either it was luck, coincidence, your own doing, or you recognize the hand of the Lord in it. The issue is not whether Ahab had good motives for what he did. I'm sure he had. We always do. People have explained to me shacking up, reversing the roles in marriage, living a life of total selfishness in language that's so moving, so human, so persuasive that they convinced me until I remembered, hey, wait, this is against the commandments of God. Nobody can enjoy the blessings of God by disobeying God. The Bible is very blunt about that. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Ahab set his enemy free. He undid everything that the sacrifice of his people, the dead bodies of his soldiers, the divine help of the Lord had given him. And so, while the two leaders are speaking peace to each other with their lips, when there was no peace, Another scene is developing off stage, as it were. A man of God is saying to his colleague, also a man of God, the word of the Lord says, strike me with your weapon. But like Ahab, the second man of God did not obey. He saw no reason why he should. What was the point? What possible good could come of him smiting a fellow man of God so he didn't do it? And so the first man of God says, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, a lion will strike you down as soon as you leave. And sure as shooting, a lion did. Now that seems like a severe, a drastic punishment. But if the men of God ain't got it straight about obeying God, how are they ever going to tell the king or the people? So he says to a second man of God, the word of the Lord says, strike me. And the guy does and wounds him. And now, with bandages on his head and dirt all over his clothes, He's standing there along the highway waiting for the king's chariot to appear. He steps in front of the horses at the opportune time. He begs a word with the king. He speaks in the words of a parable. He says, I was caught in the thick of the battle and I was wounded. And somebody said to me, here, take this captive and guard him with your life. It's important. He's a valuable prisoner. But while I was busy here and, and there, the prisoner disappeared. Ahab was a soldier. Ahab knew the importance of obedience. Ahab understood how the whole battle can be lost because one man disobeys orders or quits his post. And Ahab says to the man, you have judged yourself. It's your life for the life you lost. And at once, the prophet removes his headband and reveals his identity and says, Thus saith the Lord, because you, O king, 
Let a man go whom I determined to die. It's exactly as he said. Your life for his. Your people for his. Ahab understood that. He was cut to the quick. He went storming off to his castle, fuming and enraged. How quickly that bright day of victory passed away. And how soon the storm clouds of war would roll over Israel once again. And, by the way, life for life, people for people. There's something else here about this innocent prophet who is wounded by the will of the Lord and for the sake of others. Did you know that that is a picture of your salvation? It came literally to pass in God's son Jesus, a life for life. The innocent one goes down and the guilty go free. Now I cannot explain why God used this way of all ways to open for you the door of life. I cannot understand that love of God for sinners. I am a sinner and I can't hardly love sinners. But God never asked me to explain it to you, but to proclaim it to you so that you can believe in it, bask in it, be warmed by it, comforted, encouraged, and saved by it. Oh, people, like Ahab, we do not know what the future holds. We do not know what sorry chain of events today's disobedience to God will set in motion. That's why it's so important for us to trust and obey. And there's a grand old passage in the scripture that helps us on this score. And it says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.